Good morning to our Total Health Spokane classroom and welcome to our online audience. This is the last um, session for our Awakening Spiritual Interest this week. Next week we will be doing a new topic which is very much related and that is reaching the heart. So today I want to welcome you and invite you to have prayer as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we have to explore the fascinating topic of how you work with people and how you draw them to yourself even if they didn't realize that they needed you. Please work in our own hearts today, prepare us for ministry to other people, give us clear eyesight to be able to see how to reach them, and bless our time together with your Holy Spirit that can give us understanding. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We'll do a quick review this morning. We have been looking at the magnets and the magnetic equations that draw people to Jesus. We have on one side the red magnet, which represents God, and Christians who share God with other people. And then we have the blue one, which represents the heart, which is often cold, but can be warmed by the story of grace. <clears throat> so this morning, we are going to be looking at reaching the hostile, but a little review as we begin. There's a promise in John chapter 12, verse 32. <clears throat> Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The word draw is an active word there. It means to pull or to bring in a certain direction. I was puzzling over this verse when I first read it because I thought, you know, so many people that hear the gospel or have the opportunity to know about God, don't seem to be drawn to him. But then I learned that the opposition and the resistance that they put up is actually their response to the pull of God on their heart. So yes, in fact, they are being drawn to him. They may be hostile and repelling, but they are being drawn to him. Looking at the magnet helps us to understand this. When a person sees God's love and feels their need, they are attracted to him. When they feel a need, but they see God as a tyrant or someone who is untrustworthy or someone who is going to ask them to do things that they don't want to do, then they often repel from him the closer that they get to him. Or if they don't feel their need at all, even though it's there, possibly it's been cluttered and packed with other things as substitutes, then when God comes close, there is no reaction at the moment because they are not active in their need for Christ. This explains the different reactions that we see in people as we share the gospel with them. The three actions of the magnet are to attract, to repel, or to be inactive because at that point they don't recognize their need for God. This represents three groups of people. The one who is attracted to God is the active seeker. The one who repels from him is the hostile seeker. And the one who shows no response at all at the moment is the apathetic seeker. But you notice I put seeker at the end of all three because there is no human being that's created with the ability to live happily without God. So everyone has a nameless longing, an inexpressible craving for God that cannot be met and cannot be satisfied by anything or anyone else. The hostile, they're the ones that repel. We saw in Jude chapter one, verses 20 and 23, that there are different ways to approach people. And so here it says, of some have compassion making a difference, understanding that they are hostile for a reason. Something has happened in their life. Something has set them at odds with God. Yes, we have a sin problem, but we also have the pain of sin that casts a reflection on God and often blames God, making him appear to be someone we don't want to trust. So for the hostile, we need to have compassion making a difference. We saw that one of the, reason that one of the reasons that people are hostile is because they've experienced God's law without his love, and therefore they are hostile. We see because of this, it is love that is needed to reach them. The apathetic, on the other hand, they need to be awakened and jolted back to reality. They need to be brought to a point of need. And so they may have some rough and hard knocks that are necessary to bring them to a point of conviction. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So equation number two for the apathetic, they have experienced love, at least a level of love, without any confrontation with the law or their personal responsibility or their great need for God. And so they're apathetic. 
Um, in this case, the law is needed in order to bring them to a point of feeling their need. On the other hand, the active seeker, which is our final group of people, the active seeker has experienced both the truth or the law and the love, the balance between the two. So we see the law with the love of God creates an active seeker. So moving on now to the hostile. Yesterday we spent lots of time with the apathetic. Today we're going to spend our whole morning working with how to reach the hostile. Here's a little description of the hostile. Angry, defensive, unpredictable. They flip back and forth. One day they'll talk to you. The next day you're their worst enemy and they're spitting out accusations at you because you're a terrible person just because you love them and help them, right? Okay, quick to point the blame and sometimes even violent. The hostile are definitely a bit intimidating, especially when we don't understand what's going on underneath. So easy to take things personal. I had a really, really close friend about 20 years ago. And, you know, we counted each other best friends. And I, to this day, don't know what happened in her life. But she called up one day and she said, you're not there for me. Don't ever call me again. And she hung up the phone. And that was the last I heard of her. So people sometimes have things going on in their life that are so hard to understand. And sometimes the only way that they cope is by shutting out the people, sometimes the very people that they need. So these things happen. They happen even when you're following the Lord, even when you're trying to do your best. They happen to people. So the hostile, yes. They're unpredictable, and they're quite intense in their reactions to God and even to Christian people. Reaching the hostile. Let's go back to the four crises that God allows into our life in order to bring us to a point of need. The crisis of getting. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you feel like the hostile who are angry, who are defensive, who feel like life is unfair, God cannot be trusted. Do you think that they could benefit from the crisis of getting where they get the things that they believe will make them happy? So I'm going to suggest yes, because many times they're angry. Life isn't fair. If I could just have what that person over there had, if I could just have, you know, more spiritual blessings, if I could just have a better circumstance in, in life, if I could just have, you know, a good home, things like that, a good job, then maybe life would be better. And sometimes they have to get those things in order to come to the conclusion it didn't fix it. Okay? The crisis of losing. I'm going to suggest that the crisis of losing typically is not going to help someone who's hostile. Why? They already have a lot of pain in their life. They've already typically lost important things relationships, trust, betrayals, things like that. They're already upset and angry, so losing more things typically is just going to make them more upset. Uh, not that it doesn't have a role, but it's not probably going to be the primary way that they're going to come to God. What about the crisis of seeing another Christian who has what they don't have? Could that be beneficial to a hostile person? Absolutely. Especially when they're so angry at God, so angry at these people who have hurt them, so frustrated that life goes so bad for them, and then you are kind to them today, you're kind to them tomorrow, you're there for them, you never change in your willingness to, um, you know, to express your concern for them. Doesn't mean that you get terribly involved in their life because sometimes a person like that can suck you dry. However, you are steady, you are constant, you are available, and you make good choices on their behalf. So someone that they can trust, seeing a real Christian who demonstrates God's love, it can awaken a desire to have a better life and not to be such an angry person after all. Hearing God's word speak to them. Let's work with this for a minute here. Um, we said that the hostile have a concept of law without the concept of love. So the direct, hard-hitting, clear truths of the Bible in relation to God's law, to his judgment, to his requirements, typically a hostile person is not going to listen to those. Not as the first approach, anyway. So this is not typically going to be the approach that's going to win them. 
So, have you ever had somebody angry and argumentative and you wanted to argue with them and make your point and make sure that, you, that they saw and heard what you were saying and you made it clear to them? Did you get anywhere? Typically, no. <laughs> but that rises up inside of us when people attack and, you know, you can watch people that you're giving studies to or even health ministry with. They will come along, come along, come along, and then they become hostile and they start arguing with you. They start attacking you. They start accusing you. They start saying things that are not true. And we need to be very careful that we don't, you know, we can calmly state the truth, but we have to be careful we don't engage in the fight because that's not what they need. They need to be loved. They need to be patiently worked with. But, you know, going head to head over the truth is not going to help an angry person. They need to cool off first. So, we saw have, have compassion, of some have compassion making a difference. This applies to the hostile. They need the compassionate approach. Love is needed. Now, I would like to get to the root of why many people are hostile. This is a power packed quotation. And it is almost, I would say, probably the basis of this whole class here. Wherever the power of intellect, of authority, or of force is employed, and love is not manifestly present, the affections and will, so the feelings and the deciding power of the mind, the affections and will of those whom we seek to reach assume a defensive, repelling position and their strength of resistance is increased. Let's unpack this for just a minute. So here at the end, we have someone that we're trying to reach, those whom we seek to reach. They are defensive, they are repelling, and their strength of resisting us or the truth seems to only increase. Back again to the magnets. Here is your desire to share the truth with them, and here is their defensive, repelling, cold, hard heart. The closer you come, the more you share, the closer you get, the stronger the resistance. And if you try to force it, use the power of intellect, authority, or of force, if you try to force it without them knowing that you love them and that God loves them, they're just going to push harder. They're going to push harder and harder and harder and harder. And no matter how much you make this go together, it won't stay. Because as soon as you stop your efforts, it's going to repel away. So that is what happens in a hostile person's heart. Another way of looking at this quote is to say, here is the reason why they are defensive and repelling and resistant to the gospel. The reason why they are is because someone or some experience has been one of intellect. So what does that mean? How, how, what's an experience of having the truth presented through intellect without love? Have you ever had somebody said, well, it just makes sense. You're making no sense at all. You know, if you just look at the facts, you'll see, you know, Sabbath is on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. It's never been changed. You can go all through history. So we can prove our points. Factually, we can prove them. <clears throat> but if they're not connected with showing <coughs> the love of God and showing his desire and his character, if it's not connected with that and it's just a set of facts, then it's an intellectual approach. What about an authoritative approach? to sharing truth. An authoritative approach to sharing truth is it's in the commandments. You know, God said it, we're expected to obey it. We cannot question his authority, he's God, we're not. And so we present it from an authoritative perspective. 
and many people repel or resist and defend against that, or of force. Now, I don't know that we see a lot of force happening in the religious world right now. Definitely back in time when persecution was active, there was a lot of forcing of religion on other people, and we know through prophecy that that is going to happen again. They are going to attempt to force people to worship the way they have stated in their laws. But force, see all these things, intellect, authority, and force, they can be used in the home, can't they? So even if someone is not experiencing this in religion, as in the church that they go to, they may be experiencing it in their home. And there's a sticky fact, and that is that parents represent God to their children. So when a child grows up and there's no love in the home, their needs, whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, their needs are not being met. They're, the love that they need to nurture them for them to develop is not there. But the rules and the facts and the force is there, and unfortunately many times the neglect and the abuse also, then we're raising them to see God as someone who says, do as I say, <laughs> not as I do. They see the hypocritical side of it, and they see the pain of it, and they don't want anything to do with it. So many times when we're sharing the truth with people, we're inheriting the baggage from all their perspective about God based on their upbringing. And you know, if we pause to talk about all the stuff that's going on in the world that's attacking people and their faith in God, it's a very sad story right now. So much has happened to people in the name of parenting, in the name of religion. So this, my friends, is what I believe is the root cause of why people become hostile toward God. They repel from Christ. Why? They know the law, but don't know God's love. They're angry sometimes because something happened and they've been hurt. Why are they hostile? Something happened. Can we say that again? Why are they hostile? Something happened. They've been hurt. Uh, they're afraid of God because they don't know him. They don't understand his character. Satan often through family and church has cast mud on the character of Jesus. And that's his work from the very beginning. Even at the very, very beginning in Eden, Satan came into the garden and he's like, psst, psst. you know, you really can't trust God. Sure, he gave you this fruit and this fruit and this fruit, but he said no to that one. That means he's unfair. That means he's holding something back from you. And he, you know, you know the best of parents who are loving and who hold authority with a firmness and a loving hand have kids that say, hey, mom, you're, you're, you know, you're mean. You won't let us do things, right? <laughs> so even back in the Garden of Eden, we have uh, Satan casting mud on God's face when God was pure love and always fair and always just and always nurturing. So sometimes people, they just have, you know, they've bought into Satan's lies and temptation, and they think, no, I don't want anything to do with God. He withhold thing, withholds things from me. So how do we reach them? We have to show them that we love them. Never take their hostility personally. Oh, can we read that again? Never take their hostility personally. One more time. Never take their hostility personally, even if it's directed straight at you. Oh boy, does that happen? Oh, absolutely, it sure does. And one lady who attended my, my father's um, prophecy seminar, she came up one day and she just had her fist out. She said, are you telling me that if I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm gonna be lost? And uh, he said, no, I'm not telling you that. He said, but Jesus in the Bible is showing us how to identify the last day church, and he would like to invite you to be part of it. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm just shaking her fist. And it was straight at him, I mean, about 12 inches from his face. And so it's straight at him, but the calmness, the, the, uh, the love and the perspective to say, this is not about me. Like um, God told, hmm, who was it in the Old Testament that God said, they've not rejected you? but they've rejected me to be king and reign over them? Was it, was it David? Ah, oh, I, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank on who it was, but you know the verse. Was it Samuel to be prophet? Anyway, 
If you want to do some searching on that. Okay, yes, okay, excellent. So anyway, you know the, the idea. So never take their hostility personally, even if it's directed straight at you. Another way to reach the hostile. Uh, okay, so many times their defensiveness and their anger says, I do not want to be a charity case. I don't want to be, I don't want you to be the counselor, you to be the preacher, you to be the teacher, and for me to be this little student that, that so much needs your help. They, they feel uncomfortable many times in that role. And so because of that, Jesus gave us an amazing example. His example was to ask a favor. When he met the woman at the well who had a very broken life, and who had had many husbands and a sordid past, when he met her, he actually elevated her by asking a favor. He showed respect and courtesy to her. He didn't treat her as a charity case, even though she, she so much needed help. He treated her as someone who was able and a worthy person who could contribute. So he said, may I have a drink of water? Not only was he asking a favor and letting her help him, but he was also showing kindness to someone who was a Samaritan. And that really caught her attention because normally the Jews didn't show any kind of acknowledgement or respect or kindness to Samaritans. So in working with the hostile, it can be very disarming if we need something from them. We've even found that as a family with our neighbors. There are times, you know, we're like, why don't we go over and offer to, you know, plow out the neighbor's driveway or offer to grade their driveway for them or, you know, we get an abundance of fruit, let's take some boxes over to our neighbors. That's always good. But we have found that if we can ask them for a favor, the friendship and the bond is, is really positive. And um, so it's a really important relationship builder to win the confidence of someone who feels pretty downtrodden, pretty kicked around in life. They don't always get that opportunity to feel like they can contribute something of value. So we need to share God's love with the hostile. Here are some verses and some quotes we'll be going through just to establish this clearly in our mind that God's love has amazing power. Romans 12, 20 to 21. If you're who? enemy. That's a good word for the hostile. If your enemy, because they're going to act like an enemy. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. Here's the time when we do do good for them. If he thirst, give him a drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head to burn out the meanness. <laughs> Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. They're spitting fire out at, at you and you know, thank you for being willing to tell me how you feel. That's a positive way to respond. Thank you for being willing to share. Sometimes, you know, if we hold it all in, nobody knows how we feel, but thank you for sharing. And um, I just want to let you know that I appreciate you as a neighbor, you know, and mention a couple things specific. Appreciate them. You're overcoming the evil of their words with positive words that Jesus would say to them. So overcome evil with good when you're dealing with your enemy, when you're dealing with the hostile. Uh, Testimonies, volume 3, page 422. We should cultivate true Christian courtesy and tender sympathy even for the roughest, hardest cases of humanity. That's the hostile. Love will gain the victory when argument and authority are powerless. That's why I say when you're reaching the hostile, the crisis of hearing God speak through his word, through the law, that's probably not going to work right at the beginning. Love is quiet in its operation, yet strong and mighty in its purpose to overcome great evils. It is melting and transforming in its influence. It will take hold of the lives of the sinful and affect their hearts when every other means has proved unsuccessful. Jesus was the Prince of Peace. He came into the world to bring resistance, there's the repelling, and authority into subjection to himself. Wisdom and strength he could command. You know, he could have said things in such a logical way that it would have backed every argument into a corner. I'm not always really good at that, but he could have, you know, he could have talked to the most, the smartest person on earth. 
he could totally put them in their place as far as showing them that they didn't have a leg to stand on. But that's not what he'd use. Wisdom and strength, he could have overpowered them, he could have called down fire, but the means he employed or he chose with which to overcome evil were the wisdom and strength of love. What a beautiful Savior we have. Tell the story of Jesus. Our love for people opens the door to share God's love. Tell the story of Jesus. 60, 53 to 54 says the very first and most, most foremost, uh, try that again. The very first and most important thing is to melt and subdue the soul by presenting our Lord Jesus Christ as a sin-pardoning Savior. I got an email that came through this morning from someone who is watching the class online. Thank you for those emails. Keep them coming. And always happy that you're here. Um, but I got an email, and one of the questions was, I had been working with this person, and they gave a lot of details. And I said, I've been working with them for a long time. It's been like a year and that I've been working with them, and I appreciated you know, the details. But I responded that one year can be a very short time if you're working with someone who is hostile, someone who sometimes is open and sometimes closed, a year can be a very short time. So God's endurance, his ability to stick with a person and to melt and subdue their hearts, that can take time. We had um, about seven and a half, no, seven years uh, working with a neighbor where we previously lived. And um, when we bought the house, the people we bought it from said, you know, this neighbor over here, they're really great, but you probably shouldn't talk to them about God. But over the course of seven years, near the end of the last two years, so like five years into it, the last two years, they were just really open about being willing to talk about prayer, about God, and um, even to, to mention him in conversation. And God brought us so close to that family. They would come over all the time. We'd do things together. It takes time to melt people's hearts. None should be forward to enter into controversy, but they should tell the simple story of the love of Jesus. What is the simple story of the love of Jesus? We'll be looking at that even more. Repentance is born in the heart by beholding the love of Christ, who gave his life to save the sinner. It is the love of God that softens the hardest heart, or the hostile heart. Carry the light of Jesus. Carry it to your neighbors. When we bring Christ into our experience, they will be, there will be a loving of one another. There will be an unlocking of the hardest hearts. Love, love, love is what the hostile need. What we need is the tender sympathy of Jesus. Then we can win our way to the hardest heart. I'm not giving all the reference all the time, but you can get the notes and you'll have all of them. I like this picture here. It says, a horse will cross any bridge you build as long as the first one is from him to you. I like that. You know, and Jesus truly did that. The first bridge that he built was he came down from heaven and he got down. He was born as a baby. He lived in the trenches where we live. And because he build, built that first bridge, when we come to know him, we're willing to cross over crossings in our life and do scary things that require trust. So in the same way, we have to build relationships with people who are hostile. I met a lady, I was knocking on doors in California, uh, Rockland, California, and I remember the neighborhood knocking on the doors. She opened the door, she saw something about God, religion, I think I was taking religious interest surveys, and she said, no, nope, no thank you. And again, you'll see this recurrent theme. She said, I, I was forced to memorize Bible verses and I got in trouble when I got words wrong. And um, she went on to describe what that was like. And I told her, I said, I said, there's a lot of people that have been hurt by religion. There's a lot of people that have been hurt by people who said they were Christians. I said, it's not fair, it's not right. And um, I said, in the middle of all of that, we need to know that God loves us somehow. Isn't there a God of love? If not, are we all alone here? And as we talked and as we visited, you know, she broke down. She said, I, I, it's, it's tiring, it's exhausting to live life like this. She said, I'm all alone. She said, I can't depend on my family. I, have, I don't pray because there's nobody to pray to. Who, am I going to pray to somebody like my dad? 
And so she just went through how horrible it was to live like that. And so I just told her, I said, you know, there are times when I thought that God was severe too. And there are times that people who were religious were not very nice. But I said, if you will stop and you will say, God, I just want to know what you're like, not what the people who say they're Christians are like. I want to know what you're like. If you'll give him a chance, I said, I found that he showed himself to be loving and different from people. And she's like, you know, I got to do something because this is killing me. And it was, it was pretty powerful to see. They've got to see love. Um, Sometimes I jump ahead in my stories. I already told you about the lady, or the lady in Manhattan slam, about to slam the door. I don't want to know about God and religion. I'm an atheist. But my Russian friend said, have you ever met a God who loved you? Just looked right at her. Have you? She's like, no. And he said, well, let me tell you. I want you to meet, her, meet him today. Questions about God hinder the hostile from accepting God. But the answer... What is the answer to the questions that people have about God? If sin were the only problem, Jesus could have come down to this earth, he could have stretched out on a cross, he could have died to pay the consequence of sin, and that would have been the end. But Jesus did not only die for our sin, he also suffered for our pain, our trauma, our abuse, our neglect, and all the things that we experience as victims of people who do evil things. <clears throat> so we have this promise, and this should become the message that we then, in turn, will share with people. <clears throat> in all their affliction. How many? Oh, next week we're going to challenge this. Where was Jesus? In all of our afflictions, how can that be possible? And it is quite an amazing study. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity. He redeemed them, and he bare them or carried them all the days of old. That's from Isaiah 63, verse 9. And then from Review and Herald, June 28, 1898. Wrap your mind around this. All the abuse, A-L-L. -L. All the abuse and suffering that man could heap upon his fellow man were endured by our Lord and Master. Amazing. And it's even more powerful when we start to unpack it and we start to go through it and see that indeed, in fact, this is true. I want to share a story from the, from the Holocaust. One day when we came back from work, we saw three gallows rearing up in the assembly place, three victims, and you know the atrocities that have happened against humanity? They're so sad. They're so heartbreaking. Three victims in chains, and one of them, the little servant, the sad-eyed angel. Three victims were mounted together onto chairs. The three necks were placed at the same moment with the nooses. At the sign, the three chairs tipped over. Total silence throughout the camp. Then the march past began. The two adults were no longer alive, but the third rope was still moving. Being so light, the child was still alive. For more than half an hour he stayed there struggling between life and death, dying in slow agony under our eyes, and we had to look him full in the face. And this is what the hostile and the angry are dealing with, some kind of picture and experience in their mind that is so unjust, so painful, and so unfair that they cannot get past it to trust. Behind me I heard a man saying, where is God now? And I heard a voice within me answer him, where? is God here. God is hanging here on this gallows. It's not often that we come face to face with someone going through that kind of physical meanness and cruelty. I actually had a friend who on a university campus here in America had a group, you know groups on campuses, he had a group who actually, you know, humiliated him and hung him up on this pole on the campus. And I was like, whoa. And so, you know, it's like Jesus, he is hanging on the gallows. He's hanging on the cross. Why? Why didn't he just lay down and give up his life? Why did he do it in a physically painful, humiliating way? 
Why was he stripped? Why was he humiliated? Why did he go all through all that? Because in order to answer the question of where is God when I suffer, he needs to be able to give the example, I am here. I am suffering with you. I am not the cause of the suffering. I am not the one who is dishing out the abuse. I am the one who is suffering also at the hand of a tyrant in the universe named Satan, who is the source and the originator of all hellish pain and suffering. And so this is a physical example, but we are going to look and see that in every emotional, mental, spiritual, and any other type of neglect or abuse, Jesus is able to give this answer. Where am I? Where, where are you, God? I am here. Not only can we look back at his life on earth and see that in every area of physical suffering, mental and emotional and spiritual, Jesus felt it and went through it, but in the moment when we are going through it, it's as if we are so connected with him that everything that floods through our nerves and our heart and catches us with raw, intense pain actually floods through his heart at the same time. And so he feels it, but he feels it more intensely because he is God. Where is God when I need him? Our next class is going to be the wounded healer, which is the only message that is powerful enough from the Bible in order to heal the heart of the hostile and the, the angry and the defensive. So we will pause now for a break. We'll come back probably around 10 o'clock and uh, resume then. <laughs>